Hello, 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 everybody. Happy New Year. Um, thanks again for joining me. Um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you find this uh, video helpful. Um, I am coming today with the top 10 ICD-10 tips. And I'm coming from the aspect of uh, provider documentation is what they should have. And I'm also coming from a coder standpoint, a medical coder standpoint, as far as what you should code, how you should code it, and tips to assigning the appropriate code. And I felt it was good to go ahead and drop these top 10 tips um, as on January the 16th from 12 to uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time, there's gonna be an ICD-10 training session for three hours. It's gonna cover everything. It's a complete breakdown of ICD-10 um, and you're understanding how to assign the appropriate code. So I finished the content. So as you can see, this is the content for the training course. And as you can see, it's not one or two pages. So this is nice content, nice information. Um, we're going to be doing it for three hours, so it's going to be a lot to cover. So let me get into it. The top 10 ICD-10 CM tips. So medical record documentation and coding tips. So ICD-10 provides a greater level of specificity with over 71,000 diagnosis codes to select from. Now this requires uh, medical record documentation to be more specific uh, to ensure the most appropriate code is selected. So to assist with accurate diagnosis coding and billing compliance for uh, Medicare and especially for like risk adjustment, and these tips apply uh, heavily to risk adjustment um, coding, but it also can be um, applied to general coding as well. So these tips uh, that I'm giving are based on CMS requirements for Medicare Advantage plans, uh, the official ICD-10 CM guidelines for coding and reporting, and American Hospital Association um, uh, coding clinic guidelines. So tip number one. Tip number one is going to document all coexisting conditions related to the patient's health status. So per the ICD-10 guidelines, you're gonna code all documented conditions that coexist at the time of the encounter or the visit and um, require or affect the patient care treatment or management. So if it coexists or if it affects the patient's uh, care treatment or management, you're gonna code all coexisting conditions. So all coexisting conditions have to be documented and reported each year including chronic and status conditions. Now, status codes are used to report when a patient is a carrier of a disease, has the sequela, residual of a past uh, disease or condition, including such things as um, presence of a prosthetic or mechanical device resulting uh, from previous treatment. So in the breakdown of the class that I have on the 16th, we're gonna go over status codes and um, uh, encounter codes and all of that so you can get the full understanding of why they're used um, and how and when to use them. So status codes or status uh, conditions that might uh, impact risk include uh, transplant status. So if you're coding uh, an encounter and during the encounter, the phys physician may say, um, patient Jones is coming in, um, she has a fever, um, she's coughing, uh, I'm suspecting COVID-19. Um, also, five years ago, she had a kidney transplant. So with me reading the documentation or the encounter, I know that that patient had a kidney transplant years ago. And although it was years ago, that transplant or not having that organ may affect something that that patient has going on now. So I am going to document the status that this patient has had an organ uh, kidney transplant. So renal dialysis dependence or uh, encounter for uh, involving uh, renal dialysis. So if I was reading a chart uh, and it says a patient has um, stage five chronic kidney disease, also has diabetes, uh, hypertension, um, and is coming in for abdominal pain. Um, the patient is also on renal dialysis three times a week, um, and the condition is stable. So, 
as I'm reading that chart, when I see the patient is on renal dialysis, then there is a code for that. That's going to be Z as in zebra, one of your Z codes, which is your encounter codes or your status because the status of the patient code is going to be Z99.2. With you adding that code, that automatically indicates that this patient um, is uh, on renal dialysis treatment. So a lot of these things you won't, you won't know unless you do risk adjustment coding and you've done training, excuse me, or, and, or if you just know your official guidelines, if you know your official guidelines, if you read through them, um, if it was something that, um, you know, you closely want to look at so you can get a full understanding, then these are in your official guidelines as far as when to use the status codes and how to use them. So uh, a ventilator status. So if the patient is on a ventilator, there's a status code for that. And that's going to be Z99.1. Remember, Z99.2 is going to be renal dialysis dependence. And Z99.1 is when they're on a ventilator. So if you're reading the patient chart, if it notates or documents uh, from the clinician that they're on a ventilator, you're going to use Z99.1. So current ostomies. You're going to code from the Z93 um, and the Z43 encounter codes or the status codes when you're talking about ostomies. Um, for example, um, a colostomy bag. So that'll be an example of an ostomy. So I think that's going to be Z93.1, but the ostomies is going to be the status codes of ostomies, Z93 and that section and also Z43. So when you have limb amputations, that's also going to be something that you're going to have to code. So if you're doing risk adjustment coding or if you're doing regular coding, if you're coding for a physician's office or anything like that, um, that'll also indicate that you know what you're doing if you're capturing all of the codes that you're supposed to capture um, and not just for the encounter visit for that day. Because even if you're in a physician's office and if the patient that we're discussing has these uh, conditions or treatments or statuses for this patient, you're going to also code this. So it's not just for risk adjustment as well. It's also inclusive of you knowing what to code, when, and how. So if someone has a lower limb amputation and you're reading the chart and it notates that there is a code, you're going to come from the lower limb, you're going to go Z89. Z89, that's the code for lower limb amputation. Now, when a patient is asymptomatic for HIV, you're gonna also you're gonna also code that as well, and that's gonna be Z21. So, also if you're reading the chart, and this is not all of them, I just want to give you some the most common ones, so you'll know if you're reading patient charts. Um, although this is not maybe a part of the current visit, they may have had a transplant nine years ago. I just want you to know that these are codes that you're still supposed to code, whether it's inclusive of the current visit or not. These are status or encounter codes. Also, if a patient is um, overweight and if their body mass is one of 40 and over, then you're going to always code it for risk adjustment. Regular coding, as far as in a physician's office or anything like that, you can, use, you can still use the body mass code, which is Z68. That's the body mass codes there. So you will code whether the body mass is 20 or 25 or 27 or whatever their body mass is. But for risk adjustment, you will only code body mass codes if the body mass is 40 or over. Regular everyday physicians coding, things like that, you can code body mass no matter what it is, whether they're overweight, underweight, perfect weight, whatever. Again, risk adjustment, only code the body mass when it's 40 or over. So in the terms of risk adjustment, if the chronic and or status condition is not documented and reported annually, it indicates uh, the condition has resolved or no longer exists. That's why it's important to capture the codes every year, every time, because if the codes are not captured, then it basically say, oh, this patient doesn't have this anymore. This patient um, has been cured or it's been completely treated. And then that's when you start using the history of codes because history of just basically saying this patient had this issue, but it's been resolved and they no longer have it anymore. So, and then this can lead to like inaccurate information for their patient if you miss these codes 
because they need to know the exact status. Does this patient still have this heart disease? Um, does this patient still have diabetes? So it's important to capture the code. So tip number two, and we have 10 tips. So tip number two, document current status of the condition. So document details regarding, and of course, medical coders, we're not gonna document anything. This is for the physician. That's why I said at the beginning of this video, this is also good for physicians to know what they should document it and how so the coders, us, can capture exactly what's going on with this patient. And I also cut down queries too if you have a physician that's very detailed when it comes to the patient. So tip number two, document current status of the condition. So document details regarding the current status of the chronic condition, such as if it's acute, if it's reoccurrent, if it's chronic, if it's acute on chronic, is it in remission, etc. So including the date of onset, when did it start? Um, coders cannot make assumptions. We cannot assume anything. We cannot look at the chart and say, oh, they have this, so they must have this. No, we can only code what's documented. And I also make physicians aware of this well when I do provider education. We only code what you document. If you do, if you do not document it, it doesn't exist. So coders cannot make assumptions regarding the um, acuity of a condition. We don't know if it's acute. We don't know if it's chronic. We can't, we can't decide that. It has to be explicitly, excuse me, explicitly uh, stated in the medical record documentation by the provider who is legally accountable for establishing the diagnosis. We're not legally accountable for establishing we're legally accountable for reporting. So just as a note, avoid using terms uh, such as, and this is for, you know, like I said, provider documentation. Coders, we don't document. But, uh, and this is also good for you as well, like I said, in reading the chart. Avoid using terms such as history of when document a current condition that the patient has had for an extended period of time. Because if you say history of, coders we're thinking like oh it's a history that they don't have it anymore so if they have it over a long period of time don't use history of physician from a coding perspective history of like i just said means that the condition no longer exists and is not receiving treatment so if it says history of that means they're not taking any medications for it. they're not getting any therapy not getting any treatment it's nothing because it's resolved so when appropriate, there are personal and family history Z codes to use. Tip number three, document the anatomical site location. Uh, approximately 25% of the ICD-10 codes are related to fractures. So the location of the fracture is more specific. Um, identifying sites such as the shaft head, uh, excuse me, the shaft, the head, the neck, uh, distal, proximal, um, etc. So with this increase in specificity, documentation needs to identify the specific anatomical site and location in order to code it appropriately. So a lot of times that's when queries come into play. I'm not sure if you guys do any queries or anything, but I query a lot. If the documentation is not clear, if I'm not understanding what the physician has written or has documented, then that's when I query the, uh, the physician. I'm going to email them. I'm going to go through our EHR we use. Sometimes I text them. Sometimes I might go into the, um, the offices if I was working in a physician's office. I have to query or you have to query because you cannot assume um, what they meant and a lot of times you want to get as specific as possible so they can go, uh, go back and document the specific anatomical site. So these are tips one through three. I'm not going to have uh, astronomical uh, long videos, so I'll break it up. So this was just tips one through three, and then I'll do the rest of the videos as follows uh, in sequential order. So again, thank you so much for joining. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And if you have any questions about anything that you saw, I mean, excuse me, anything that you've heard in this video uh, regarding ICD-10, don't forget to uh, drop a comment, and I'll be glad to answer that. Um, don't forget, on January the 16th, um, there is an ICD-10 training session from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and I'll put the link in the bio for the Eventbrite ticket.
See you soon. Thanks for joining.